This week's episode of On The Ledge is supported by Hoppy, the home management website where you can save money on your household bills and find tradespeople for all those jobs around the home. Why not see how much time and money you can save today at hoppy.co.uk. Hello, I'm Jane Perrone, and this is a podcast. It's called On The Ledge. In episode 143, we are tackling the furry and disturbing topic of mealybugs. Plus, I answer a question about a floppy calathea. Before we get started... This show is usually a refuge from the events of the outside world, but the goings on in America and around the world in response to the death of George Floyd is something I can't ignore. And I never thought I'd be quoting Meghan Markle, but as she said the other day, the only wrong thing to say is to say nothing. So I just wanted to say that for all of you who are in the US or indeed anywhere around the world who are feeling enraged, angry, sad at the fact that racism is still a part of our lives in a fundamental way, then I join you in spirit because I feel that too. Because it needs to be said and shouted from the rooftops, Black Lives Matter. I've decided to give the ad revenue from this episode to a number of different causes that are tackling racism, both in the UK and the US. So far, I've given money to the Marshall Project, which is a non-profit journalism organisation which writes about criminal justice to the Innocence Project, which works to reform the US criminal justice system by helping to get wrongly convicted people exonerated. I've also given a donation to the Loveland Foundation, which is a therapy fund for black women and girls in the US. Thanks to listener Paula for flagging that one up, and she's running a raffle for a painting she's done, and I'll put details of that in the show notes. And seeing as I'm in the UK, where I'm sad to say racism is also a major issue, I've also given donations to the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust and the Black Curriculum, which works to get black history onto the curriculum in British schools. I have got some more money to give and I'd like to offer you guys the chance to tell me who you'd like me to donate to. So do have a think. And if there is a worthy cause anywhere in the world that tackles racism, then let me know and I will try to select as many as possible to give a donation to so that all the ad revenue from this episode goes to anti-racist causes. As a white person, it's part of my responsibility to listen and to learn. And I am going to continue and ratchet up my efforts to make sure that the guests that I get on this show are as diverse as possible. And I've been tweeting about lots of people of colour in the worlds of horticulture and botany this week. But I'd also like to hear from you. I'll put a list of all the organisations I've donated to so far in the show notes. Also there, you will find a couple of Google documents that are really excellent if you want to find out more about what's going on, and I hope you do, and donate and offer your support in lots of different ways. There's one for the UK and one for the US. So do go and check those out as well. And I've heard from listeners who are directly caught up in events in the US and my heart goes out to you. There is a post on the Houseplant fans of On The Ledge group where you can share your experiences if you wish to do so. And the final thing to say is that I hope that On The Ledge will always be a community where everybody everybody, whatever your sexuality, race, geographical location, religion is welcome. And I'm sure that all of you feel the same because we're all brought together by that wonderful thing, the plant. Okay, cue slightly awkward segue. And now it's time to get on with the show. And this week I'm talking to Professor Raymond Cloyd about mealybugs. 
Oh, God, the shiver down the spine when we think of these furry little beasts that take up residence in our plants and are very hard to get rid of. In fact, in this interview, Professor Cloyd calls the mealybug the pest of the 21st century. That really does set my heart rate doubling. But we're going to find out not only what these things are, how they attack our plants, but also, most importantly, how to tackle them. Just before we do that, I've got a crucial job to do. And that job is going out to my greenhouse to check for mealybugs. You want to join me? Right, let's go. Off we go. Off we staying inside. Probably a good idea. It's not that great weather today. Right. You're familiar with the sound of this door by now, aren't you? Okay, so let's have a look. When you are looking for mealybugs, I'm down here with my cactus and succulent collection, which spends the summer out here in the glass house. That's a fancy name for what it really is, which is a kind of a potting shed slash greenhouse combo with a half glass roof. The things to look for are the nooks and crannies really because that's where these mealybugs will hang out and duplicate furry stuff white blobs that's what we're really looking for so when i'm examining each plant knowing the ones that have had infestations in the past that's what i'm looking for and it's easy to get a little bit of perlite mistaken for a mealybug so don't panic if you do see something because it needs close examination before you know what you're dealing with. So far, so good. Just working my way down. No, nope, that's just a bit of dust or something. Uh, working my way down the line to see what we've got. Now, it's easy with cacti sometimes to mistake <laughs> the fluffiness that you get of the areole with a mealybug. So I've got a lovely Easter lily cactus, Echinopsis subdenudata, which is just coming into bud. Those aren't mealybugs, they're buds, so that's good. Oh, hang on, hang on here. So this is worrying, okay. I've got a Calenco here, Calenco Dorothy, and I'm seeing a little bit of fluffiness here. This plant's kind of coming back slightly after being knocked back in the winter, but, oh yes, yes, darn you. Look at that. So I'm seeing in the new growth top growth of a little bud at the bottom and on the leaf the telltale cotton wool signs of mealybug darn well i'm immediately just going to remove that shoot because that's the easiest way of dealing with it and i'm going to examine the plant closely all over to check if there's anything else i'm going to put that to one side that's going to go straight in the bin let's see if i can see anything else to worry about on this plant hopefully i've caught it early doesn't look like there's any more on here. I will examine it over the next few days and keep a really close eye out for more. But that means really that I need to look at all the plants that have been around that plant uh, very carefully because if there's one mealybug, there will no doubt be more. But that's all I'm seeing for the moment. So a further examination will occur. And it really is a case of constant vigilant with the, vigilance with mealybugs. And doing these checks and that way you can catch it early please do excuse me while i go and stick my head down the office toilet and scream <laughs> yes we have mealybugs i repeat we have mealybugs but it's professor cloyd to the rescue uh well yeah i'm uh dr raymond cloyd i'm a professor of entomology in the department of entomology at kansas state university in manhattan kansas uh, the state of kansas in the center of the country. I focus primarily on horticultural insect pests in a number of cropping systems, including greenhouse, nursery, turf grass, landscape, interiorscape conservatory, uh, fruits and vegetables, Christmas trees, and, and, and I handle pollinators, and now I also handle hemp. So I handle, I do not handle field crops, corn, that's, I handle only horticultural specialty crops. I believe that you are a mealybug specialist, so this is great to have your expertise to deal with this pest that so many houseplant growers have problems with. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess my first question is, and this sounds like the most naive question, and I'm sure you must laugh at my ignorance, but <laughs> what exactly is a mealybug? Where does it fit on that kind of spider diagram of different kinds of insects, invertebrates, and so on? Uh, that's not a, a dumb question, Jane. Basically, uh, so mealybugs are very much related to scale insects. Scale insects are also houseplant pests. Uh, brown saw scale is a big one. But uh, uh, mealybugs are very closely related in terms of their feeding behavior to aphids and white flies, leafhoppers, and scales. They feed within the, the phloem sieve tubes. The phloem is the food conducting tissues. Uh, they e- emit honeydew, which is a sticky liquid. And the honeydew, of course, is a viable substrate for the black city mold, which you'll see on your house plants if you don't manage mealybugs. And of course, that blocks photosynthesis. So. So mealybugs are in the order we call hemiptera, which is used to be called homoptera, and uh, they're in amongst uh, again related to aphids, white flies, leafhoppers, and scales. So that's where they kind of fit in that whole category. Okay, and I guess the thing that distinguishes these from any other pests is their kind of white fluffiness. I guess you could even think they look cute, but if you've got an infestation of these things. <laughs> It's not cute, really, because they can be quite devastating. Are there particular types of plants that they are attracted to more than others? Yeah, that's a good question. They they are very prolific, as meaning they feed on a wide range of plants and not just house plants. Um, I think, you know, the, one of their favorite hosts is coleus. In fact, that's the plant we use in our research and have for the last 20 years. But you'll find them on house plants. Um, I'm thinking of the, uh, uh, um, well, Cissus rhombifolia. I, I'm trying to, uh, and then uh, African violets. You'll see them on, uh, you know, different bakia, uh, prayer plant, um, in uh, fig or ficus. Uh, they're, they're, they're a problem on, on many house plants, but also they can be a problem on some plants like chrysanthemum and marigold. Um, and Gerber daisy, Transville daisy, they love Gerber daisy. We, we could grow them on there. But if I was to pick the number one host, I think coleus would be the main one. That's so interesting. I grow coleus and I don't think I've ever had a mealybug on them. So there you go. They're obviously not attracted to my coleus. I don't know. I have had mealybugs on other plants. You're, you're lucky, Jan, but I can send you some. But yeah, the, <laughs> the, the, other, the other group of plants that they're really um, uh, our problem on are succulents. In the United States, we have a lot of growers getting into succulents. Succulents are getting very popular. Uh, I don't know if that's the same in Europe, but mealybugs are extremely problematic on succulents, hens and chickens and stuff, because it's hard to control them. Once they get down into these very tight areas, it's very hard to get them with any type of spray. How do the mealybugs make it onto our plants? Are they always just coming in on new plants that we add to our collection, or is there any way they're kind of traveling to us? other than on plants we've brought in? It's important to understand that they do not fly. The only uh, flying stage is the males, but they don't feed. There are a number of ways they can get on. They can travel from plants. One is on people's clothing or hands. Plants that are touching, where the leaves touching, they can move from one adjacent plant to the next. Uh, wind currents, you know, wind or from doors opening or horizontal airflow fans uh, can be there. And, and because they're so small, you don't notice them until you start seeing the, the blobs of white and then it becomes problematic because uh, at that point, the, the females, which can, can give Leia about 600 eggs, start just basically producing lots of different generations. 600 eggs? Is that a, a, a day, a week, a day? How many? Well, don't tell me it's a day. But let me give you the life cycle. That might help us see. Okay, so a female mealybug, especially citrus mealybug, which is the predominant species we see in houseplants, but there's also the long tail and others, she can lay up to 600 eggs. Those hatch that we call nymphs or crawlers, and they're very small. They're very hard to see on a plant. Uh, they start moving around, and they go through a series of uh, molts or instars. And after about four or five, the male becomes a winged individual. He has no functional mouth parts. He mates with the female, then dies. But they do feed on the plant. And so then as they're feeding, they're, they're sucking up the phloem. They're producing honeydew, and then you get black seed and mold. You'll see ants in the area. Ants will feed on the honeydew. Sometimes they'll tend or protect uh, the mealybugs. And then the female, she'll lay her eggs under a cottony mass for cottony, uh, such as mealybug. And under her is 
between 400 to 600 eggs, and then she dies, but not before she lays her complement of eggs, and those eggs then will hatch. Uh, well, uh, those eggs then larva nymphs will emerge from the eggs, and you'll start another generation. So the, the number of eggs produced by the female is within one generation. Wow, I see. So really, if you've got, if you start with one mealybug that um, that lays six hundred eggs, that's going to get go nuclear fairly fast, isn't it? That's why we're <laughs> we can end up with these really bad infestations really quickly. And and how long do they live for? What's their? I mean, the males obviously, presumably, it's a very short and uh, limited existence. What's the? How long does does a does a female mealybug live for? Is it a matter of days? Well, the entire life cycle can occur between twenty five and sixty days, depending on temperature. Females can live. Uh, several weeks uh, overall before they die, um, but not after laying her egg complement. So each life stage will have a certain number of days. And of course, like all insects and mites, it's dependent on temperature. But the, but the life cycle from egg to egg laying female uh, ranges between probably 30 days to 60 days. Is the issue of mealybugs something that's kind of stayed level uh, in terms of the industry H- have mealybugs kind of become more of a problem in recent years or is this something that's always been around and has always been being tackled by growers no that's a good question jane they have actually increased i actually am calling them the pest of the 21st century and let me explain why uh in our research we have found that systemic insecticides and um, your audience might know those as you apply them as a drencher granular to the soil the plants take up the material and then get into areas where the uh, uh, insects like aphids and whiteflies and mealybugs feed. In our research, we found that systemic insecticides are not effective against mealybugs. What that means is you have to use what we call contact insecticides. Well, uh, you have to get good coverage and you have to make frequent applications because of the life cycles of the mealybugs. And mealybugs are extremely sneaky. They hide in cracks and crevices of, of plants especially larger plants, uh, and that makes it difficult to get good coverage. And so uh, they are increasing. And the other problem is we don't have very many good biological controls that are predators or parasitoids commercially available for mealybugs. And and, and that's why um, mealybugs, to me, is, is, is much more problematic than some of the other common uh, pests that greenhouse producers and, and uh, homeowners deal with. Uh, on a regular basis. Those of us who are still in the wonderful honeymoon state of never having experienced a mealybug infestation, what are the first things to look out for so that you can catch them early before they start to multiply too quickly? That's difficult for homeowners because they don't always do this, but it's regular. if you know your plant is susceptible, it's just regularly monitoring, checking the plant. I mean, yellow sticky cards will not work for mealybugs because they don't fly, so you have to sort of Look at your plants closely. Uh, the first instar nymphs are hard to, to see. So sometimes I tell people, shake your plants gently over a black piece of paper and, and you'll, you'll see the nymphs there. Um, uh, because one, once they get to the point of egg laying females and you have, say, 50 females on a plant and you got crawlers, it's too late. I mean, at that point, you might as well just throw the plant away because not, it's not going to be effective in managing populations. <laughs> despair professor cloyd will be back after the break with a solution to the mealybug issue but now it's time to hear from our other sponsor for this week's show when it comes to looking after our pets we all like to make sure they get the absolute best and that's where bee loved pets comes in Thanks to Bee Loved Pets for supporting On The Ledger this week. Their range of wellness products includes shampoo bars, nose and pore balms and an odour eliminating candle. I've been trying them out on Wolfie and they all smell so good. Bee Loved products are free from parabens and extensively tested on humans because if it's not good enough for us, it's not good enough for our pets. This is totally true. I've ended up washing my hands with the shampoo bar because it feels so good. Plus, all the packaging is plastic free. So, for 15% off your first purchase from Bee Loved Pets, visit wearebeloved.co and enter voucher code JANEP. 
beloved pets shipped to the US and Canada, the UK, Europe and Australia. So visit wearebeloved.co now and enter voucher code JANEP for 15% off your first order. Be loved, proper pampering from palm to paw. Now it's time to get back to the mealy bugs. The treatment that I often see bandied around on the internet, that den of bad houseplant advice, um, and the, <laughs> yeah. the treatment that I've used on my own plants, it, what we would call here in the UK a cotton bud, but what you would call a Q-tip, soaked in, again, what you would call um, rubbing alcohol and what we might call... Uh, um, I'm looking at the bottle of it here, surgical spirit or similar, um, applied to the mealybug body, which is all very well when you've got like a, a smallish plant. But I mean, if you've got a huge citrus with an infestation, <laughs> that's not quite as practical. Is that a good, I mean, if you have a small plant, A, is that a good treatment? And B, what's the what's the alternative? Is there a more, um, is, is there a better treatment for, for larger plants where you just can't, have enough uh cotton buds slash q-tips around yeah i would say the the rubbing alcohol or ethyl alcohol 70 percent is going to be for people with a lot of time on their hands and small uh a small number of plants and very small infestations it's not very practical when you've got many plants orchids or other house plants and you've got uh, infestation so what we typically recommend is a um, if you can take your plants outside is to uh, use a force of water spray to dislodge the mealybugs by getting thorough coverage of all plant parts. That saves you from using an insecticide. Now, in some cases, the insecticides we typically recommend are the insecticidal soaps, the potassium salts and fatty acids, or some of the horticultural oils based on petroleum, mineral, or neem. But these are these are only contacts. They don't have very long residual and you got to get thorough coverage of all plant parts, and you have to make applications at least once a week. And people just don't remember that. So that's why the mealybugs take off. And so when the when the plants are over 50% infest with mealybugs, it's time to throw the plant away, RIP, uh, because you're really not going you're not really going to be able to get uh, adequate suppression or sufficient suppression at that point. So again, mealybugs, it's really high preventative. Uh, maintenance to to avoid your plants from being infested with mealybugs, being mainly because of the biology, the reproductive nature of the females, and most of your insecticides are contact only, and you, and they don't last very long in the environment. Now there are other insecticides available, but I don't always like to recommend them in homes because they can cause problems like allergies or something like that. But if you take them outside, you might be able to use some of the more uh, the more um, non-selective uh, materials that that you would use, although soaps and oils are non not selective, but they're less toxic to humans than some of the other materials that are commercially available. That's interesting. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was: Are there different species of mealybugs, and are there ones that specialize in roots as opposed to top growth? Because I've lost a few African violets to what seem to be uh, more of a root mealybug infestation, which really was something that I wasn't prepared to, to battle. Yes, we have mealybugs that feed on above ground portions. That includes citrus and long tail, the, probably the most common ones. And then we do have root mealybugs. Uh, yeah, and they are a big problem in the United States uh, on cannabis crops. And, and because they're in the soil, uh, it's harder to get at them with some insecticides and even some of the biological. So uh, that has been a, a big problem in some commercial operations uh, with, with cannabis and, and even non-cannabis crops of these root mealy bugs, yes. So even if you've got a, a, an infestation on top growth, is it worth taking the plant out of its pot and dislodging or washing off all the soil just because there might be mealy bugs lodged in the stem and nooks and crannies around the, the the point where the soil meets the meets the uh, top growth the, the, there are mainly bugs that feed on the above ground portions leaves and stems and those that feed on the below ground part so if you have mealy bugs on feeding above ground you don't need to worry about the soil but if you notice your plants getting stunted and wilting even after full uh, water applications then it might behoove you to you know take them out of the pot and see if there's an insect 
like a root mealy bug that's feeding on the root system. Yeah, yeah. This is the, I think for me the root ones are worse than the top top ones because mm -hmm. they yeah. just are really really um, tricky to to get hold of. In a way though, I, what I do like about about finding a root mealy bug infestation is that you kind of that it, it for me it then makes the decision to to get rid of them easy because I just know I can't fight them. So <laughs> I don't try and battle. I just give in, which I guess is. Um, saves me probably a lot of work it did occur to me though that you know maybe uh the old q-tip and uh rubbing alcohol uh method during lockdown if people don't have a lot to do this could be this could take up quite a few long st stretches of hours of uh <laughs> treating your plants individually mealybug by mealybug but um yeah, I mean, that's, that's... Uh, just put on some nice music and sit there and do it while you got nothing else yeah. to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mindfulness. There we go. That's a much sure is a mindfulness activity. Yeah. Uh, OK, uh, let me look back at my list. So we've talked a bit about those chemical treatments and um, but you did say there weren't many biological controls. Is there anything on the market in terms of biological controls that you can opt for? Well, there is uh, an insect called the mealybug destroyer. That's the common name. It's a uh, ladybird beetle. Problem is it needs it needs a lot of mealybugs. So uh, we don't recommend it unless it's an interior escape because it's not going to clean up your plants very well because it needs so many of them. So um for a houseplant situation, when you have isolated plants, uh, biologicals just don't work. But for an interior scape where you have lots of plants, that might be something to use when you're not looking for 100% elimination. That's really the only one commercially available. There are uh, green lacewing larvae, but their efficacy is not very consistent. And uh, the parasitoids, there is one out there, but I don't know how readily commercially available it is in, in Europe. Uh, and it has limited availability in the United States right now. Tell me what that is, just out of interest, just so I can look out for it. Well, it's called Anagyrus pseudococci. <laughs> Anagyrus uh, pseudococci. It's a uh, parasitoid that attacks the uh, early instars of the citrus mealybug. We've we've been trying to get some to do research, but you know we get them and we can't get them to establish. So uh, it's 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 out there, but I really don't know how effective it is in regulating. Uh, especially in in, in houseplants, uh, mealybug population. So we've talked a little bit about some of the symptoms. Are there any other symptoms of mealybug? I mean, we don't always spot these things. Are, are these things uh, moving fast enough that we might, at the stage, at the adult stage, see them actually moving about our plants, or are they slower than that? Well, they're pretty slow, um, you know. And the, the mealybugs will move around after they find a uh, after they find a place to sit and feed. They will will move around. They're very slow moving lethargic. Uh, the, the problem is the nymphs and the crawlers, which are more active, are more difficult to see. But the, the later end stars, especially when they get the waxy coating, uh, are very easy to see. However, by that point, it, it's sort of almost too late. Now, if you have a very minor infestation, you, you can use your rubbing alcohol, Q-tip, or, or, or a water spray, or one of the insecticidal soaps or oils, and just direct your applications at these localized infestations. Um, but when you start seeing lots of mealybugs on plants, on stems and leaf undersides, it's probably time to dispose of the plant because you're really going to be have a difficult time dealing or managing the population. And after 20 years of studying mealybugs, do you have any, I don't want to say fuzzy feelings for these creatures, have, have they wormed their way into your heart at all, do you? Or do you just want to destroy them all? <laughs> yeah, well, I enjoy mealybugs. You know, I've been rearing, I rear them for 20 years. We, we rear them and they have a special place in my heart. I, uh, I kind of call them fuzzy insects. And I think that uh, it would be a great children's toy to have a, you know, nice fuzzy white mealybug out there because uh, they are kind of cute a little bit. But, um, you know, really, I mean, it, like all insects, I'm really really enamored by their you know evolution and how they can how, how they can uh adapt to certain situations like again uh systemic insecticides just don't work and uh they have developed resistance to insecticides not at the same level as other insects but you know insects are are the most abundant organism on the planet and, and they are for a reason i mean and for so uh mealy bugs are just are just part of that system and uh and right now, they're, they're, it's a concern because it's very difficult to manage populations. And so there's a lot of inputs from insecticides and, 
in, in losses of throwing plants away because of this insect. One of the things that's often recommended when it comes to controlling any pest or protecting your plants from any pest is this idea of quarantining new plants that arrive. I mean, is it enough to have my newly arrived succulent on one side of the room and six foot away to have my other plants? Or do they... How far apart would a plant have to be and how long should a plant be in quarantine before you're convinced that there aren't, there isn't uh, an infestation of some kind, particularly mealybugs? Well, your idea of quarantine is quite relevant and they're under our coronavirus situation. But uh, <laughs> I think if your plants are wearing a mask and six feet away are in good shape. No, but I think really when, when, when you do get a new plant like an African violet and you have a collection, I would I would isolate or quarantine it. Um, for at least a week, uh, and, and, and then check it daily for any insects, because by that point, uh, under the temperatures in a home, uh, you know, you should see some insect or mite activity. So um, that that's where about a week, and, and keep it in another room or wherever, or if you have an extra greenhouse space. But see, if you bring a plant like an African violet that you buy and has mealybugs, and you put it with your collection, then they're going to spread among the, the rest of the plants. And that's why isolation or um, quarantine is, is recommended. Now, it isn't always feasible, but we do, we do recommend it as much as possible. Many of my listeners are fairly new in terms of the last few years of getting into houseplants, and they're just not ready for that moment when the first infestation happens. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's uh, having, having grown plants for a long time myself, I, I'm p- possibly more uh, cynical now about, uh, about that. And, you know, I do, I, I do hear stories of people buying plants from, you know, reputable growers and them arriving with mealybugs, and that's presumably because because it is such a successful pest that is so hard to control in a nursery situation. Yeah, and the growers do the best they can to to uh, alleviate the problem. But you can't get you can't kill every mealybug on a plant. It's just not possible. No, dealing with mealybugs is a lot of prevention. Uh, once they're on the plant infested, it's too late. You might as well throw it away. So it, it involves scouting your plants regularly, especially the ones you know they're susceptible. And then you can apply the rubbing alcohol under low level, low infestations or apply uh, insecticidal soap, a, a commercially registered soap or oil on a regular basis. But you also have to get thorough coverage of all plant parts, including leaf undersides and stems, if you really want to mitigate any issues with mealy bugs. Yeah, th- that's where they're always hiding out, isn't it? In those nooks and crannies, which yeah. is uh, why it's uh, they're so hard to control. Well, that's really great to have your input. And um, uh, we will continue our fight against the mealy bugs. I'm slightly horrified. Obviously, this is your job. So, of course, you have to do it. But I'm slightly horrified about the idea <laughs> of you raising generations of mealy bugs. Presumably, that's so you can test out different strategies and uh, uh, let them loose and then see if you can control them yeah yeah oh, well, my yeah gosh. yeah we we continue to research uh you know uh testing various materials and biologicals but it's always it's always a battle yeah it's uh they, they have evolved they have they have these behaviors and mechanisms that really make it difficult to uh to deal with them uh with with insecticides and uh it, it takes it takes persistence and diligence to deal with mealybugs and, and they're under our current situations lockdown this is, an op- uh, this is a prime opportunity to exercise diligence of patients and, and, and deal with mealybugs if you have them. Well, that's your weekend sorted, isn't it? You're all going on a mealybug hunt. Thanks to Professor Cloyd for his help. And if you want to find out more about him and his research and his top advice on dealing with mealybugs, check out the show notes where I link to a pamphlet full of information about this particular pest. And now it's time for question of the week, which comes from Laura. And it is about a Calathea lepidina or Gepertia lepidina. As taxonomy freaks will know, Calathea has been transferred to the genus Gulpertia. Doesn't sound quite so poetic, but we'll go with it. So this Calathea slash Gulpertia, it's been around for about three years in Laura's house. And it's been doing okay, but as it's got older and it's started to... 
Sorry, I'm distracted by the fact that it's so windy here that my quince tree is flinging its young fruits against the glass and making a noise. <laughs> I've got a good harvest coming, so I hope they don't get damaged. But anyway, uh, high winds here today. What can you say? Anyway, let's crack on. So the where did I get to? The plants getting droopy and hanging over because of its own weight. And Laura can't seem to find the answer online. Apparently the plant flowers regularly. She's got no idea if this is a sign of good health or procreation as a last resort. <laughs> good point. And it's been both under and over watered over the years. So some of the leaves show signs of this, but generally it's put up with my poor treatment. So Laura wants to know how she deals with it and can she keep her plant upright for the future? Now, looking at this picture, I think this plant is undergoing some drought stress. The leaves are currently rolled up at the sides, which with the Maranta group plants is definitely an indication that there's a bit too much dryness going on. And I think generally I find with drought stress that if you water the plant and moisture gets to those roots, they will unroll fairly quickly. So if they're still rolled, I would say this plant is still probably a little bit unhappy with water levels. I note it's in a terracotta pot. And I would generally say that I prefer Marantas in a plastic pot. Uh, that's just because of my watering regime. But yeah, it might be worth giving it a good soak, especially at this time of year. That should be OK, provided it then gets the chance to drain. And because it's in a terracotta pot, it will dry out more quickly anyway and the water will evaporate. So give it a good soak and that should sort out the rolled leaves. In terms of the droopy growth, I think this plant, despite being a low light plant, needs a bit more light because I think it's becoming leggy and drooping over because it's just not getting enough light to make it happy. So I'd recommend Laura moving it to somewhere where there's a little bit lighter. So that might just mean moving it from its current location to a location, say, another metre or two metres towards the nearest window, you know, without dramatically changing the circumstances of the plant. That could be enough to make a difference because you know what? When you get a light metre out and you stand in one spot and then go a metre or two metres near a window, you'd be amazed by how much extra light there is. Just make sure it's not somewhere where the plant's getting direct sun. That, though, is not going to magically take away the leggy issue that you've already got. It will prevent the plant getting any leggier. The new growth will be more stocky, but it won't take away this issue of the current droopiness because that's already kind of set in stone. So what do you do about that? Well, I mean, I, I know that you've tried some yarn and a large knitting needle. I, I'm liking your style there, Laura, but... Uh, you've got a couple of different options. Either you find some way of staking it as you have done and holding it all together, perhaps with some yarn, or you can go a bit more drastic. It seems to be that this legginess is on what particularly on one side and you could go really drastic and repot the plant and literally cut it in half, repot into a smaller pot and keep the part that's not so droopy. It sounds drastic, but it's one way of dealing with it and you might actually find it solves the problem. If you don't like the idea of that, then you could even just cut away that droopiest stem and let the plant reshoot. The plant will respond by reshooting as long as it's happy in every other respect. And then you'll end up getting a fuller plant in the longer term, which still looks kind of comfortably stocky rather than this droopy look. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, calatheas can get quite tall. If you look at the descriptions of them, oftentimes you're talking 50 to 60 centimetres in height. So they can get quite tall. And the flowering, well, yes, plants can flower as a result of being a bit stressed. And therefore they're thinking, yeah, I've got to get some reproduction going on here. So that could be an explanation. It may be just that your plant is quite mature and has been happy enough to flower and I wouldn't say that's a bad thing whatsoever. I think if you can just get the light right then your plant will will go from strength to strength and you can also address this issue with the slight humidity issues and what I always say when any, ever anyone's got a plant in the Maranta group is do check for spider mites because general 
malaise in a plant can be an indication of the dreaded spider mite which is a very common problem for this group of plants and do check out the spider mite episode if you haven't heard that already because there's lots of top tips on dealing with that in that episode. So Laura I hope that has in some way or other assisted you with your lovely lepidina it's a beautiful plant and I think you should be able to get it looking great without too much more work and I'm by the way this you need to go and look at the picture of this plant on the show notes because the knee, knitting needle that Laura has put in the pot is flipping enormous wow I don't know I'm not a great knitter so I don't know what you use that for but it's it's a chunky old it's a chunky old needle so, <laughs> so thank you very much for sending that question in Laura and if you've got a question for on the ledge then drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com episode 143 I will be back next Friday and just remember the words of Maya Angelou as you go through your days this week if you're always trying to be normal you'll never know how amazing you can be bye music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin, and I Snost I Lost by Dr. Turtle. The ad music was by the Hefdone Banjo Orchestra with the tracks Dill Pickles and Whistling Rufus. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit janeperone.com for details.